Welcome to the OmniTalk Fast Five, sponsored by Fast Sensor and Takeoff. Bippity boppity bubbly. Today is December 3rd, 2020. I am Chris Walton. I'm Ann Mazinga. And I'm Emma the intern. I'm sorry. I am I'm still a little <laughs> thrown off by what exactly just happened. Dude, that Bibbidi, is the greatest bobbidi, expression bobbidi? of all, Bumblebee. That was the greatest expression of Bumblebee. all time. I heard it from my, my first grade son's teacher today. And I was like, I got to drop that into the podcast. But anyway, we are the Omnitech Talk Fast Five. And we're here to break down and debate all the top headlines in the world of retail. Today, we're going to talk Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Kohl's and Sephora, Best Buy and Micro Fulfillment, a little Amazon and Grocery. And then we're going to close out with a fun and important story surrounding Chinese food delivery. And no, that's not just because Anne and Emma are huge Seinfeld fans. But first, we got to see how everybody's doing. Man, we also, I think we need to pay a big homage today to the passing of Tony Se from Zappos. Emma, I got to start with you. Um, like, resident, you know, Gen Zer here. Zappos, where does Tony, where does that fit for you in, in the whole Parthenon of, of retail? I would say like, I'm very aware of Zappos and for my entire undergraduate education, education, they are used as like the perfect company in terms of customer service. Like I've done so many case studies on Zappos, but in terms of actually like shopping on Zappos, I don't, and I don't know of anyone kind of around my age that does. Did you know of him? I did, yes. You did, okay, from those case studies. And yep. how about you? Like, how did you take the news this week? Yeah, it's, I think that's hard news just to see. He was a young guy, and yeah. that's always a difficult thing. Um, and he's just, he had such a huge impact on the way that retail, especially e-commerce retail, works and functions. He was one of the, the founding fathers of e-commerce and, and really that customer experience. And yeah, it's awful. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not really sure what else to say. It's just a, unfortunate. Yeah, I had a buddy text me. He's like, man, it shows you, yeah, it's just so quick. And you know, it's something I always remember because my dad died when he was 38. But, um, you know, it's, I, I got to tell you, it was, yeah, it was a big thing this week because I loved his book. Um, I'll share a couple of moments with the audience here just because I think it's important. But I loved his book, Delivering Happiness, if you've never read it. When I first started OmniTalk, I always, I, I, it's not there anymore. But at the time, I, you know, I had a page that said, these are the business books that you know, mattered a lot to me. And that was one of them. And there were a few takeaways I had you know, from that book. And Emma, you hit on one of them, which is like, like you know, when it comes to customer service, how do you think about new ways to exceed expectations? And understanding what expectations really are, right? Like we have a sense of what we all think the expectations are, but that might not be the expectation that the customer has. And there's a lot of ways to think about that psychologically. And then the other one I always took from him was he has this great excerpt, excerpt in the book where he was learning how to play poker. And he talked about not all poker tables are the same and using poker as, a, as an analogy for business. So know what poker table you're sitting at, know what market you're in, know how competitive it is. Are you playing with a bunch of sharks? Or are you playing in waters where really no one knows how to play and you're the expert or you know how to do something better than anyone else does and i always thought that was i always thought that was a really fascinating thing that i've, I've never forgotten about as we've as we've looked and done things here especially uh you know uh, uh on the you know on the omnitalk side of things and and also with the urban rooster side of things that we're we're doing now big announcement last or yesterday and yeah we're expanding We've had so much success with the Twin Cities and Minnesota market that we are expanding urbanroostershop.com to the other Midwestern states of Wisconsin, Iowa, North and South Dakota, and more coming to an urban rooster shop near you very shortly. But check it out. Or if you know brands or your partners have side hustles and they are selling things on their e-commerce sites uh send them our way and we would love to get them onto the platform yeah absolutely as i like to call it we are now expanding to minnesota adjacent states because i think that's i think that phrase is funny uh but yeah if you're if you're doing business in any of those states i just mentioned you know drop us a line shoot us an email uh hit us up on linkedin we want to help. We want to do what we can here still before the holidays. Thanks to everyone that supported us so far. We cannot believe just the outpouring of enthusiasm, the traffic we're seeing to this side. Thanks to all the local brands that have played. Emma, the intern, thanks for all your help as well. You've been a godsend as we try to stand this thing up. So 
All right, guys, should we get to the top headlines for the week? Yes, let's do it. All right. And you're up first, I believe. Is that right? Yes, I am. Well, we couldn't come back on the OmniTalk Fast Five without starting with reporting on Black Friday and Cyber Monday. It was, as everyone is not surprised to hear, a banner weekend for online shopping. Uh, we saw a ton of traffic on our own site, urbanroostershop.com, but so did these other spaces. Um, Black Friday digital sales totaled $9 billion. Cyber Monday hit almost $11 billion. Uh, holiday shoppers spent 15, an average of 15% more than they did a year ago on Cyber Monday. And this is the largest U.S. online shopping day ever. We also saw traffic at Black Friday or on Black Friday at stores falling uh, about 50% compared to last year. So definitely a huge push with online shopping this last Black Friday and Cyber Monday. And one more thing that you know I was really taken aback by was that Shopify merchants they made 5.1 billion dollars in worldwide sales over the Black Friday Cyber Monday holiday. And if I as I look at all of the headlines from that Cyber Monday and Black Friday data, I think that the Shopify information is the one that really sticks out to me as the most important one because a majority of those Shopify vendors are independent retailers. And I think we saw this huge surge this holiday of support for those local or independent retailers and hopefully a trend that we're gonna continue to see uh, for years to come. But curious, Chris, Emma, what, what did you guys see in these headlines that really struck you? Or was yeah, there anything that struck you? I don't, I don't know. This kind of felt to me like the whole, the old adage, you know, if a tree falls in the woods, does it make a noise? Like, I, <laughs> I, I mean, I think Black Friday happened, but I mean, the digital side of stuff, that doesn't mean anything to me. Like, of course, it's going to be the biggest day. Every year, it's the biggest day because every year more people go digitally. I actually think when you start looking at the numbers, you know, they're saying Cyber Monday was only up like, you know, I think ranges are like 14 to 20 percent, depending on like what numbers you're looking at. That doesn't seem like a lot to me in relation to like, you know, what you'd expect given what's going on with the pandemic. The other interesting note that came out right before the podcast as we're recording this was the National Retail Federation and then a study by Prosper Insights and Analytics as reported in the Wall Street Journal said on average consumers spent $312 on holiday purchases from Thanksgiving to Cyber Monday. And that's actually down 14% from 2019. Mm -hmm. So so I don't know. There's not a lot to take away from the numbers here for me. Um, it also just didn't feel like there was a lot to take away from the whole last few weeks as like a consumer either. That was really interesting. I think the Shopify thing is fascinating because I think you're just seeing how strong that platform is and what it means for local businesses. But I don't know. That would be my take. Emma, what do you think though? I mean, is there, is there any generational perspective that I'm missing here? I do think I actually put together a presentation as part of my teaching requirement as a TA on Black Ooh. Friday and Cyber Monday, so I can just spit like numbers out of my. Yeah. Are we going to get Emma the intern uh, master a master's degree lecture here? Let's do it. I'm excited about this. So what I do think is really interesting is looking at that 10.8 billion on Cyber Monday. Amazon yeah. Prime Day brought in 10 billion dollars, and while that is global sales, right. I think, like I made a prediction in my presentation, that Prime Day is going to take over as the yearly kind of highest grossing in terms of sales event. And then also over the weekend, Amazon third party sellers brought in almost $5 billion as well. And that counts as part of these digital sales that are recited. So I think that it's just interesting, you know? Yeah, no, I think you're right. That's the, that's the part of the story too, is that the Amazon numbers inside of all this are still massive and then when you factor in what they did with prime day and now the flexibility of where they can put that year in and year out uh that's that's pretty crazy i think it also still tells us possibly that stores still matter to some degree for at least what black friday is as an idea or as a feeling i mean and you and i used to love it we'd go to mall of america every friday morning at 6 a.m i did miss that like yeah that was different like and that's something fun and exciting to do that's the experience of retail that you just can't get back online that I do think matters. Yeah, and I think the the whole nostalgia or like the memory and the, the whole delight of being somewhere and the traditions that you have surrounding those holidays, I don't think um, will be impacted in the long run. I think this, you know, 50% fewer people shopping was just 
a result of the pandemic and people being extra careful, but I, I think it'll be back next year. Yeah, hundred percent. Actually, to be honest, it probably wasn't the biggest story of the week. I mean, the biggest story of the week was probably the next one. I think there was a headline that stole the thunder from all of that. All right. So if that's the lead to story number two. That, that was the well-planned <laughs> lead to story two. Yes. <laughs> all right. So Kohl's is not playing games. They are planning to open 850 Sephora beauty shops in their stores by 2023 with the goal of having 200 of them open by next fall. So stab in the back to JCPenney here. They're coming right after Target and Ulta, but I kind of don't hate this. I'm not a big Kohl's or Sephora person. I saw the like little drops of the Sephora shops in the Kohl's. And I think that this is actually like my mom and her friends would love this. Like they would definitely go get their makeup from Sephora at Kohl's. So definitely not pulling in Gen Z in my opinion, but like, my mom would be all over this. <laughs> my Ma's loving this. My intern is loving this. And you've got a lot of thoughts on this. I know you do. What are you well, thinking? I, I think, we I haven't think this headline. About this at all, so I'm dying to find out. I think this headline is incorrectly written in that it should be Sephora is expanding to 1100 locations throughout the next year. Because let's be real here, people. Sephora separate entrances with banners like this is not about Kohl's. This is about their off mall locations being valuable to the Sephora customer now who Sephora's were a big mall store. And now they have all these locations in smaller, smaller places, um, off mall locations. I think that this makes complete sense. I mean, Sephora got totally, like Emma said, they got totally hit a couple of weeks ago with the Target Ulta partnership. I think, you know, this takes their, what, 600 stores that they have now. A lot of them, a lot of those stores being in partnership with JCPenney's, several of which will be closing. And it really gets them in direct competition with the, their, their biggest competitor in the space, Ulta. I think, um, my question is just how long before Kohl's buildings just turn into Amazon, Sephora, a gym, a grocery store, and a small section of Kohl's home appliances? I mean, the, the only losers here, my grandma, who's going to go in there and be like, where's my Croft and Barrel sweater? I can only see makeup at Sephora. Chris, what do you think? I, yeah, you, well, you say, I think you saved it for me at the end. I, I, I love this. I think it makes a ton of sense. I think it's funny when you look back to the rumors when they were talking about pulling out, this must have, of JCPenney's, this must have already been in the works. It makes me also wonder what conversations were being, you know, had with, you know, other retailers, i.e. the ones that Ulta is now partner with at the same time. Who the heck knows? I have no idea, but you have to think all this was going on. I think... I'm starting to love Michelle Gass. I mean, I've been hard as heck on them in terms of what their value proposition is. And I, I don't necessarily think anything of that was wrong because Kohl's doesn't have a value proposition as we've talked about in our minds. But when you start realizing that and then taking actions that make your locations and presences relevant again, you can start to matter. And that's what they're doing. So they're putting Sephora in. I think, call, I'm calling it now, if in 2021, there's an Amazon Go inside of a Kohl's, Michelle Gass is the 2021 retail CEO of the year because she's got something. I mean, that's a cocktail that's the equivalent in suburban strip malls of essentially a Walmart or a Target with some pretty darn good convenience aspects and some things that you can't find at those lower end retailers that are Target and Walmart. So I am loving this. I am buying this one hard. But she's got more to do. I think that's the thing. There's more work to be done. And you're still shaking your head. You're not buying. You're not buying. I just, I nuts. want to be careful. I mean, who gets the credit for this though? Like I, yes, it's fine. But like how much of this is, that was going to my earlier point with like, how much of this is Kohl's? Like as the department store, maybe that's my like incorrect way of thinking about this. But I just feel like, so Kohl's is now just like more of a real estate developer because they're bringing all these people in. And I mean, they, I guess they are like the Sephora associates will be Kohl's employees trained in Sephora to speak, you know, the, depending on the, the Amazon station is staffed by Kohl's staffers. So I guess it's just, you know, it's thinking about reimagining the entire Kohl's experience. I just think there's still for me a disconnect because they're still like, this Kohl's department store that's trying to like sit alongside 
these other concepts that are going in the store. I just, I, I need a little bit more like synergy to make it's this like a hundred percent something I'll get behind. I hear what you're saying. It's cognitive, cognitively dissonant because it seems like the outroad is to not be Kohl's anymore. Right. But that's the beauty in accepting the fact that that's your outroad and that's not what a lot of people willing, are willing to do. And, and there's a lot of people that would make the argument that retail is just a real estate game anyway. You know, you're renting yep. the space to the brands that are on your shelf, so to speak, the, depending on the cost structure, it's not a lease, you know, it runs different ways. But that's the part of this story for me too, that we didn't hit on. And then we can move forward, I think is that, man, this shows you the sorry state we have with malls. Sorry yeah. state we have with malls. Because like, no one wants to be there. And now we're just creating these micro malls. So like it says that there's just no value there anymore. What are they going to do? Yeah. I mean, the, the last thing I'd say then is Michelle Gass, by all means, take some more credit for it. The earnings report that just came out was like, we've got $2 billion brands that were selling out of Kohl's, Sonoma and, you know, uh, these other brands. It's like, then take credit for this innovation that you're doing and, and well, get out, like, they've been taking, yeah, they've been taking a lot of credit for innovation before the anything result. And this hasn't happened yet either. And all sure. this stuff we're conjecturing on also hasn't happened. Like the fact that they're in bed with Amazon and she's probably sold her firstborn child to Amazon as well. Like none of that has been proven. Cannot be confirmed at this time. So we're hopeful, but yeah, still a long road to go and God, we'll see, you know, you know, who all comes in. Uh, and you're right. Emma's right too. Like, still a lot of rebranding has to be done to get some of those younger generations into this just because you put it in there even in amazon go doesn't you know it's not feel the dreams that people are going to get in there and start shopping it too but but we'll see all right i think we beat that horse to death the third story i think this one's awesome too the ice is great according to retail dive best buy is testing new store formats at four locations in minneapolis as a proof of concept for stores as fulfillment hubs the remodels limit SKU assortments on the Best Buy selling floor to the most popular items and reduce shoppable areas by nearly half, allowing more space for pickup and shipping from store. The retailer says it plans to add 90 ship from store hubs during the holiday season, supplementing the already 250 ship from store locations that it started in September. And CEO Corey Berry this week also said that she anticipates as many as 450 ship from store locations over time. Don't forget too, that this also comes on the heels of another story in the news this week, that even though we talked about Instacart and Best Buy, I think it was on last week's show or the week before, Best Buy is also using shipped for last mile deliveries and just specifically for last mile delivery fulfillment for, uh, for any orders that are placed with them that they wanna use shipped for the delivery. Very different from you know, I as a consumer go with Instacart, get my stuff from Best Buy, et cetera. This is all I'm interacting with Best Buy and Ship is sending everything out. So more of this kind of a white label service like we've talked about. I think this is awesome. I think it shows that Best Buy is so on it in terms of what needs to happen. Like micro fulfillment is the future. We talked about it. Takeoff's our sponsor. That's where things are going. And now they're thinking about delivery in the same week as a white label service and how do you just get goods to people faster and efficiency. So it's about picking and packing efficiency. And it's about last mile efficiency. And what's not to yeah. love? Oh, I, I, have, I have been loving this week. I was like headline after headline. I'm like, Best Buy, you are just slaying this week. I love it. You know, no, is it slaying with a Y or an E-I-G-H? Oh, are you bringing the holiday into this biz? Of course I am. All right. it's December. All right. Okay. Uh, well, no, I think this is super smart. You know, I was actually feeling some, there's been, there's a lot of nostalgia talk on the podcast today, but I was feeling some nostalgia. Do you remember the days back in Best Buy when you would like run to Best Buy, cross your fingers that that double disc all eyes on me, Tupac set was still in the racks at Best Buy of all the CDs. Like think of how big Best Buy used to be. And like, you needed it to be that big because you had to sort through the DVDs and the video games and the movies. And you were going there for the sales experience. And you think about now and 
I don't really, you know, you don't need the sales floor and the boxes are still the same size as they always have been for the last 20 years. So it makes sense that they're moving towards the store pickup. They're converting these to fulfillment yeah. centers and they're really leaning in on what makes Best Buy different and better than Amazon right now. And that's service and all the store locations and being able to pick something up within an hour. And they, are, I don't know if you guys have tried their curbside service, but I sent a note to Best Buy after doing their curbside service twice in the last month because it's been seamless. Like they have just yeah. been killing execution on curbside. And I know I'm sounding like an overly excited Best Buy uh, supporter right now, but I just, I think this makes a ton of sense. Um, it's really going to be best utilizing the space that they have. And I think will help stand them up uh, as, as competitively as they can be to go up against Amazon. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I never thought about it. Like Best Buy is ideally situated to recreate service merchandise based mm -hmm. on how that worked, but modernized by technology. And we've talked about that for years. I talk about that almost every time I go on stage somewhere. Like, you know, basically like, yeah, if you get that fulfillment running, like that model can work and you don't need as much space on the sales floor. I do need to go back to that reference though, because that definitely does not work for me. Shout out to Allison Hahn at Sephora, but you know, mine was more Almond Brothers, like trying to find that Almond Brothers CD. That was kind of hey, how, that's whatever how your flavor is, that. but you had yeah. rows upon rows upon rows of CDs to go look through to find your Almond Brothers and Tupac in the same spot. And you could get batteries and, you know, a washing machine and a TV if you wanted to. I, I did, and it was hard because ABBA was always mixed in there too. But Emma, like, what do you think here? Like, is this, uh, you, you were shaking your head on the curbside Best Buy pickup thing. Oh yeah, the curbside experience is great. I went there once on like a Tuesday at 6 p.m. and it was popping. There was like a line of waiting for parking spots. I think that this idea is brilliant, but my actual favorite part of this story is that I never looked, but I just assumed Corey Berry was a man. And so I think it's even cooler that she's actually a female CEO. No, it's huge. Yeah, no, and she's, yeah, and she's fairly young too. Like she's a young female CEO. So that it's huge news. And Best Buy is progressive on a lot of fronts, that being another one. I, the last thing I would say too, and you made me think of this is, um, if they can pick curbside orders that quickly, the big next question is how fast can you pick, I'm standing inside of a store order to create that service merchandise experience. So right. that, yeah, I can really just shop as like Best Buy salespeople are my concierge and everything is just happening for me wherever and whenever I want it to happen. I think that's yeah, you, an interesting you to, angle here I haven't thought about. Yeah, you have to imagine that those pieces are being put into place too as they're preparing for that ship-driven pickup and fulfillment too. I mean, those orders are picked in, picked by Best Buy associates and you know ready for the ship driver in a matter of an hour so yeah I, I think that's definitely possible yes exactly and that's a point people need to hear right it's like if you can crack the code on that then like you don't have to send the ship drivers in to deliver everything everything is just stationed and ready for them right there and then it's just about having people compete on price for last mile delivery and you as the retailer win huge huge point all right emma story number four all right Amazon has opened its fourth grocery store location. This new grocery store is about 25,000 square feet and it's opening in the North Hollywood neighborhood of Los Angeles. And so clearly these must be going well, it must be successful. I wanna know when they're coming out of California because despite a very bad experience I had with fresh gross grocery last week, I would, still, I would still go to these stores if there was one in Minneapolis. And I think I would drop everything to go to an Amazon fresh store. Really, why? Because I actually, believe it or not, have some of those statistics for you. So that's cool. But why? Why would you drop everything to go to one of those stores? It's just, it seems so easy. It can be like getting all my groceries. Because right now I go to like three different grocery stores, depending on which one has the better price on vegetables. But in my experience, the like Whole Foods prices are honestly pretty good through Amazon Fresh. So it would just, it's so easy. Amazon knows everything about me. If they could make it so that I don't actually have to check out which I think they will be able to do. Mm -hmm. I just, time. yeah, I'm just loyal yeah, to my Amazon grocery. You're loyal to the Amazon grocery. Yeah, no, I think, I think honestly, this is the biggest, most important retail story of 2020. Um, and I think that's fascinating because it has nothing to do with changes that were precipitated by, you know, the coronavirus at all. Um, and so to Emma's question, actually, funnily enough, I called Amazon PR, sent them an email yesterday to try to get some stats. And I wanna make sure people out there listening understand the degree to which Amazon 
has gone into grocery over this past uh, year and or last two years, if you include Amazon Go. So if you look at Amazon Go, here are some stats. We'll read them off quick. Amazon Go, 26 stores now in Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and Seattle. They also have two Amazon Go grocery stores. So that's like Emma said, the 10,000 square footage store, give or take. And those are in, in Seattle and Redmond. Uh, you walk in, you just walk out. And then they also now, according like Emma said, four Amazon Fresh grocery stores. Those are in Woodland Hills, Irvine, Northridge, and North Hollywood. Now I asked, what are the plans for 21? Got no updates on Amazon Go, which makes me think those are still coming uh, pretty fast and furiously. And then of course, Amazon Go Grocery, they've said they now will expand into Washington DC in 2021, but here's the kicker. Here are the plans for Amazon Fresh grocery stores between now and the end of 2021. Amazon confirmed for us that they plan to open fresh stores in Naperville, Illinois, Whittier, California, Long Beach, California, Oakland, Illinois, Schaumburg, Illinois, Bloomberg, Illinois, Woodland Park, and Woodland Park, New Jersey. That's a heck of a lot more cities and count my math guys, but I believe that means they'll be in three states by the end of 2020 if all plans come to fruition. That's big. That's pretty different. I mean, that shows you they're going into physical grocery in a pretty big, bad, and bold way. Yeah, and the, takes, the scale at which they're able to do that, I mean, they're, it's, it's clear that this is going to be a very easy lift and land for Amazon at the speed at which they're rolling out these grocery stores. And not small. I mean, they're 25, 30,000 square feet stores, um, just their fresh stores alone. And then you start to think about what, how many go grocery stores they'll start to expand upon on top of that. And yeah, it's just astonishing. I mean, I think the thing that is top of mind for me right now is what are you doing if you're a regional grocer and how are you prepared for this? Because they're coming on strong. These fresh stores have been opening next door to or across the street from Trader Joe's and Target's and Walmart grocery stores and other big regional grocery chains. I mean, they're, they're coming to a neighborhood near you. So how are you thinking about the technology um, or the experience that you're going you're gonna to put into your regional store if you're going to try to compete with these? Because I think that is the one thing for me that's still lacking is like the Amazon fresh grocery stores still feel a little cold to me. There's not the like immersive experience that you might get at a, a regional grocer. But that's, I think that's the key point. And it's what Emma said, you know, you've got a, a young generation of consumer who just said, I will go there if I can get in and get out fast. And you have to realize that what is going to happen here is you're going to have the 10,000 square foot go grocery store. On the other side, you got a 30 to 40,000 foot Amazon fresh grocery store. The go size of the operation is going to continue to creep up and creep up yeah. and creep up. They're going to figure out general food operations along the way in the bigger one. And at sometimes those two models are going to converge. And that is the experience you are probably most likely going to have. And no U.S. retailer has even experimented with that idea at this point in time in the same way, shape, or form. It's just crazy to think about in terms of what the next few years are going to look like in that space. All right, Ann. Let's All talk right. a little Chinese food. I'm taking us home. So... Hungry Panda, a food ser delivery service that's based in London that caters to Chinese communities overseas, announced that they have just raised $70 million. Hungry Panda will use the new funds to continue their global expansion, delivering authentic Chinese restaurant food and groceries to the estimated 50 million Chinese people living abroad. They've already expanded this year to uh, 47 cities globally, which is up from the 31 cities they were in just in February. Now, I think this is brilliant. I fought to have this story included this week because I think when you think about the amount of people that, especially in big cities like uh, the coast, where you have a lot of people who are, you know, from other places, being able to have an app that not only is in your native language, the whole Hungry Panda app is in Mandarin, but also can find, in my case, like other people that love tater tot hot dish um, or the best restaurants near me that can sell me tater tot hot dish, this nostalgic, authentic cuisine from my hometown of Minnesota that I want delivered to me when I'm feeling lonely and sad in my apartment in New York. And, and sorry, but for those not for what, those listening, what could get better hot dish than that? is basically a casserole, right? Just for those Any that maybe hot aren't dish. from the Midwest. Any casserole, okay. yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Doesn't have to be, have tater tots. Could or could not include tater tots, but 
let's just say you like tater tot hot dish. Now, if Hungry Panda expands into the uh, mid Midwestern cuisine category, I might be able to get that when I move to another city because it's too cold here someday. But what do you guys think? Okay, that was a reach, but okay. Yeah, all right, I got it. Emma, what do you think? I think it's so cool. My boyfriend, who spent a part of his time growing up in Hong Kong, still has his family there, sent him things from Hong Kong that you just can't get yeah. in the States. And if he could get it through an app where his grandparents don't have to like go out, get it, send it, I think he totally would. So I think this is an awesome idea. Right, and they're in the native language too. I mean, it also makes me think it's super repeatable. I mean, I think there's a cool, a couple cool angles here. I mean, it's super repeatable. It's gotta be repeatable by language across different designations. I mean, the one unlock for me in, in launching Urban Rooster is I underestimated the degree to which, you know, people care about local things and wanna be a part of where they grew up and came from. And we've, you know, had a number of orders from people that are from Minnesota, but not living in Minnesota anymore. And it, makes me think of like all the towns where there's Pittsburgh Steeler bars or Iowa Hawkeye bars and that's where people go and they congregate. So these types of things really start to matter. And you go back to the Shopify statistic in the beginning, that's why that stuff matters too. That's why that platform is so, you know, inherently fascinating. So there's something, there's just something there to like the empowerment of localized retail, not just only in the locale, but across the world for whoever wants to feel like they're still part of where they grew up I, I think that's i think it's it's i think it's fascinating yeah and i think positions you in a in a better spot when you we start to talk about the stories that we've been covering today like the amazons of the world you know if you can if you can hit or solve on the the nostalgia or the or giving somebody a feeling or emotion when they're buying something which we know people care more about they're looking closer into where they're making purchases and if you can use technology to make that a more seamless experience and compete with Amazon on the convenience angle of it, I think that this is something we're going to continue to see accelerate. 100%. All right. Well, that wraps us up today. If you haven't yet, be sure to check out. We have an awesome article that we co-produced with Azita Martin, who is the general manager of AI for retail and CBG at NVIDIA. It's a great article. I think it captures everything you need to know about what, frankly, most of the times we think is quite an overdone topic in the media. I mean, how many companies have I talked to in the tech space who are like, we're an AI company, but this really breaks it down for you in terms of where you can expect AI to impact retail in both the short, medium, and long term. It's worth the read. It's pretty quick. It only takes about three to five minutes. And I think I highly recommend it for everyone. Of course, we want to give a big shout out today. Happy birthday to Jenna Dewin. Not Jenna Dewin Tatum anymore, but Jenna Dewin. Tiffany Haddish, and Anne's favorite George of the Jungle, Brendan Fraser. And re oh, remember, no. <laughs> remember, if you Hard can no. only, read, only read or listen to one retail blog in the business, make it Agni Talk. Our Fast five, 5 podcast is the quickest, fastest rundown of all the week's top news. And our twice weekly newsletter tells you the top five things you need to know each day and also feature, features, <laughs> as some would say, special content exclusive to us and just for you, all within the preview pane of your inbox. And you also get George the Jungle jokes. You can sign up today at www.omnitalk.blog. Thanks as always for listening in. Please remember to like and leave us a review wherever you happen to listen to your podcast or on YouTube. And of course, be careful out there. The Fast Five Podcast is brought to you and sponsored by Fast Sensor. Fast Sensor is the first AI-powered business intelligence platform that provides business owners with ROI-focused optimization tools tailored to fit your organization. With Fast Sensor, you can successfully monitor safety, efficiency, and journeys across your organization from customer flow to queue management to the effectiveness of digital signage and promotions. Visit FastSensor.com to learn more. Takeoff. Takeoff is transforming grocery by empowering grocers to thrive online. The key is micro-fulfillment small robotic fulfillment centers that can be leveraged at a hyper local scale. Takeoff also offers a robust software suite so grocers can seamlessly integrate the robotic solution into their existing businesses. To learn more, visit takeoff.com.